his uh, seminal work in 2001 really changed um, the safety profile of, of inflammatory drugs, citing what um, Vioxx did, and he's um, probably responsible for making that whole class of drugs much safer for us. And then, um, surprisingly, uh, he did it again with Avandia in 2007. Both of those were lead hunches that he got criticized heavily for following, that he continued to pursue because he thought it was important for our safety, that is, human safety. Um, so he stood up when many others would not have stood up and uh, did take on and has been responsible for helping foster um, patient safety and drug safety in what I think is uh, an on, a, a truly remarkable and honorable way. Most of us would have, uh, I know I would have, folded many times over in the process and with I, I got to see some of the pressure uh, put on Steve from the other side. So Steve, we are truly privileged um, to have someone who really stands for wellness and stands for it in everything we do um, in medicine. So thank you for being here. Thanks, uh, Mike, and I'm uh, very fond of uh, Mike Roizen as well, um, even though he's trying to put us out of business in, uh, in the Heart and Vascular Institute and doing a, a fairly good job of it. Actually, you know, it's interesting when you think about what all of you do here. Um, uh, in talking with uh, chairs of cardiovascular medicine around the country, uh, the rates, they're all very upset uh, because the rates of, uh, of angioplasty stenting are, is down about 20% nationally. And they're all lamenting the fact that, you know, their business is drying up. And it's funny because they're lamenting it, but I'm sort of celebrating it, and you should celebrate it because I think it actually is a tribute to what's been done in the area of prevention. So when I'm not involved in, in drug safety, I'm involved in, in, in the prevention area uh, with intravascular ultrasound. And um, I'm going to share with you, you know, insights that we've developed over the last decade or so um, on how to uh, reduce the progression and even induce the regression of coronary disease. If you think about a lot of what people do in, in, in the wellness area, it's really about preventing disease. But what's exciting about the developments is I think it's pretty clear that with the right therapies, we can not just uh, prevent disease, but we actually can, can regress the disease. So um, financial disclosures are very important. Uh, I do consult with pharma. Um, even though, you know, I have been critical, uh, I'd, uh, I call it tough love. Uh, and we do a lot of clinical trials uh, in the Heart and Vascular Institute and in the department that through the coordinating center, C5. Um, and these are the companies that we work with. Uh, however, I don't accept any reimbursement from pharma. Any honoraria are paid to charity so that I receive neither income nor tax deduction in order to maintain my independence, which I hope uh, all of you uh, also do because it's very important. So turns out Mike Brown, uh, this guy right here, is coming to the uh, this fall's uh, Cardiovascular Innovation Summit, so you get a chance to meet him if you'd like. Uh, Mike Brown and Joe Goldstein won the Nobel Prize uh, for discovering the LDL receptor. Uh, it was incredible work, and it's what led to the development of the statins. Once they understood the biology, statins became possible. And so I take you back now more than a decade to 1996. That year, the 4S trial, the first big study to show that statins could reduce the risk of heart attack, of a second heart attack in people that had, had a myocardial infarction, was published. And uh, it was absolutely a landmark, and after that, the whole statin uh, prescription rates went way up and took off, and they wrote this ill-fated editorial in the journal Science entitled Heart Attacks Gone with the Century, in which they predicted that we would have no heart attacks by the year 2000 because we'd figured it out. Um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, LDL caused, you know, myocardial infarctions, and if you lowered LDL with statins, all MIs would go away and we would be done with this scourge of cardiovascular disease. Uh, needless to say, winning a Nobel Prize didn't make them all that prescient. They were completely wrong. And 
Uh, that is why we are all here uh, talking about this disease to, to this day. In fact, uh, statins are remarkably effective drugs uh, that re reduce morbidity and mortality from cardiovascular disease by about one-third. Um, however, if we put statins in the water supply, we would still have cardiovascular disease as a leading cause of death in, in um, developed countries. And I think part of the problem is that we failed to appreciate and they failed to appreciate the fact that it is a lot of things about our modern lifestyle, things that you have to deal with and live every day in the Wellness Institute that are responsible. Uh, diets in America are extraordinarily atherogenic. In fact, to illustrate that, I've actually traveled around the world looking for the world's most atherogenic food. And I, I, I finally found it actually at a party at Mike Roizen's house. Um, and he served me. He did this to me last time. Yeah. And he, and, and he had this picture. I want you to deny the picture is real. Yeah. And he, uh, he served me one of, one, of, one, of these, one of these things. And, you know, uh, I want you to see it. I, I've traveled the world looking for the most atherogenic food. And this is it. It's a, it's a deep fried Mars bar. Um, and uh, uh, I actually served these in Scotland, although not at Roizen's house. And the way you do it is you take a Mars bar and you batter it, and then you deep fry it in lard, and you take it out and it comes out as this nice warm gooey mess, then you eat it, it goes straight to the left main coronary artery, and then you die. And uh, there is no statin in the world that's an antidote for a deep fried Mars bar, I can assure you of that. So we've been interested in stopping this disease, and I've been certainly interested in it for much of my career. Um, to understand where we are and how we got there, there are some principles you have to understand. When I was a fellow longer ago than I wish to admit, um, the, the ultimate diagnostic test for coronary disease was the coronary angiogram. And what... Uh, we did, and we still do, a couple million times a year, is squirt contrast dye into the coronaries, and we, we find narrowings there. And in the 1980s, everybody said, this is it. In fact, my, one of my mentors referred to coronary angiography as the Supreme Court of cardiology, because if you don't know what's going on, just do an angiogram, and you'll, find, you'll figure it out. If there's a, a narrowing in the coronary, it's coronary disease, and if there's no narrowing there, there's no coronary disease. Coronary disease to us 25 years ago was simply a plumbing problem. But there was a problem, and the problem was that we were completely wrong. That we thought coronary disease was a disease of the vessel lumen, and in fact it is not. It is a disease of the vessel wall. And it is this plaque in the vessel wall that determines the natural history and pathophysiology of the disease. If that plaque ruptures and a thrombus occurs, it doesn't matter how big the lumen was. That patient's going to have one of three things, none of which are particularly good. They're going to have an acute myocardial infarction, they may have unstable angina, or in one out of every three patients, sudden cardiac death. And the size of the lumen, it turned out, was not a predictor of whether the plaque was going to rupture or not. This was a profound observation. To this day, many cardiologists still don't get. So that the amount of narrowing in the coronary had very little, if any, relationship to whether or not that plaque was going to rupture and cause an acute coronary event. Now, how do we know that? Well. About 1985 or 86, um, a group of us began to work on the idea that we needed to see the plaque in the coronary artery. And you have to understand that prior to this work being done, we had a disease that was the cause of death in 50% of the population, and nobody had ever seen a coronary plaque in a living patient. It was, it was unknown. We could look at the lumen, but we couldn't look at the wall, the artery. 
And so we eventually arrived at the technology that, to do that, and it's called intravascular ultrasound, and many of you are aware of it, uh, and I've talked with you previously about it, but the way it works is a small catheter with a high-frequency ultrasound device on the tip uh, is rotated at 1800 RPM inside of a sleeve in the coronary, and it sketches out like a radar dish or a sonar, uh, this image of the, of the coronary, and you can see the catheter, you can see the flow channel, the lumen, and you can see that, and that ugly mess is lipid-laden plaque in the coronary artery. What's the, the relative um, dark area between the plaque and the wall? That's the media. Thank you. Uh, that is the muscle in the wall of the artery, and it's a very important landmark we always look for. The external elastic lamina is right there. Why does it show um, black? Because it does not reflect much ultrasound. It's very smooth. You know, muscles are, muscle cells are not very reflective, whereas the plaque is fibrous and has microcalcification and all kinds of other things that reflect back ultrasound. So that's a great question. So, what did we learn? Well, within the first 25 or 30 patients that we studied, we saw something rather profound that has had more impact on my own thinking about coronary disease than anything else, and that's this. We began to realize that coronary disease did not work the way we thought it worked. That we start life with, let's say, a normal lumen, and you get a fatty streak very early in life, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute, and that as the plaque develops, as you accumulate cholesterol in the wall of the artery, the lumen, the flow channel, does not narrow. It stays the same size. This was first proposed in 1987 by a, a pathologist, Cy Glagov at University of Chicago. I believe Mikey probably knew Cy Glagov when you were there. He's still around. Uh, he's in his 90s, I think. And brilliant. He's still, he's still good. Still goes to lab. Brilliant observations from pathology. He said, we don't think that coronary disease always narrows the artery. Well, in fact, he was right, and we could see it, and I'm going to show it to you. This is profoundly important, because how do we detect the presence of coronary disease in patients with suspect, with chest pain? We do things like stress testing. Well, if the lumen isn't narrowed, there's no restriction to blood flow, the stress test will be completely normal. And that is why somebody like the famous runner Jim Fix was a marathon runner, and he dropped dead when a plaque ruptured. He had wide open coronaries, but with lots of plaque in the wall. And I'll explain as we go through this why this is such an important concept. It's called coronary remodeling. And let me show you an example that's just is illustrative as anything I could show you. And I wonder if we could have from our AV people, I think the lights could be down just a little bit lower. If I hear snoring, we'll ask you to turn them up again. Okay. So this is uh, the left end here descending, that's better, coronary artery. That's a little too far. But um, yeah, whatever. That somewhere in between. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, feast or famine. Okay. So. The right coronary over here just got a, got a stent. Actually, you had to be there in the cath lab to actually hear this conversation. I don't usually tell this story, but uh, the interventional cardiologist had just either ballooned or stented the right coronary artery, and he, he says to this uh, gentleman, 